All right, good morning. If, you've been, if you're visiting with us, just kind of an update on what we're doing. Right now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through the different I Am statements of Jesus through the book of John. So today, if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, begin turning to John chapter 6. And today, we're going to be looking at I Am the Bread of Life is what we're going to be looking at. But before we get into this and we start introducing this for today, first, I want to thank everyone who came out yesterday with, and helped with the Hispanic ministry kind of block party kickoff. We had several, several Hispanic families come in Hanaro, which is our associational Hispanic missionary. He's also a pastor of a church plant in Telahoma, was here and he was able to engage a lot with some of those families who didn't quite know English well. He was able to talk with them, share with them, and we are actually looking and starting a Hispanic Bible study on Sunday nights beginning next Sunday, the 18th at 6 o'clock here at the church. And hopefully, Hernaro will be able to start that Bible study, and over time we'll be able to help plant a Hispanic church in this area. And so this Wednesday night, our, for our prayer time, our prayer meeting, we're going to be meeting over in the other building in our Cornerstone classroom, and we're going to be praying for the Hispanic ministry, specifically their Bible study, them getting started, praying that God will just do a movement there, and then we'll be able to come back at some point and say, hey, we're actually going to be starting a Hispanic church. And so just, um, again, thank you so much for all those who came out last night to help with that. Um, Hanaro. I uh, was very thankful he was able to talk and share with a lot of different families, and so that was really good. But today what we're going to be looking at in John chapter 6 is Jesus' statement, his first I am statement of the seven we'll be going through, I am the bread of life. And so today he's going to, we're going to be looking at, he's going to be kind of contrasting physical hunger and spiritual hunger. Jesus is going to use that to contrast our needs there. And it's simple, right? When we're hungry, physically, we kind of know what that means, right? We need what? Food. Yeah, you can say it. It's not a trick question. When you're physically hungry and you're hungry, we know it, it, we want food, right? And, and we know food will help satisfy those hunger pains and that, that need there. Well, spiritually speaking, we're hungry as well. And we're going to see that the solution to that is Jesus. Now, before we get into this, kind of a little bit of backstory. We see Jesus, when, he's, when he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan, he was hungry physically. And Satan told him, hey, just turn, if you're really the Son of God, just turn the bread, into, the stone into bread and eat. And Jesus said this in Matthew 4.4. 4. He said, he answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, interestingly, that was a quotation from Deuteronomy 8.3, where it says, uh, speaking to the people, Moses speaking to them, it says, God humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors have not known, so that you, may, you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Meaning that God gave the people manna very specifically to point them to their need for the word of God. That they, need, they can't just live on, this, on bread alone. They need the word of the Lord. Now it's interesting because that little story and that little tidbit comes back in John chapter 6. And I want you to kind of remember in the back of your minds this idea of manna being point, trying to point people and all that kind of stuff. Happened about 2,000 years before Christ came along. Time of Moses. And then all of a sudden, we see that come up 2,000 years later in a conversation that Jesus has with the people in John chapter 6. And also a side note before we get into John chapter 6, um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. So it kind of fits in there, I'm the bread of life. He was born in the tent, little town called house of bread. Just thought you might find that interesting, might want to know that. So our first section we're going to look at to kind of set the scene here is John chapter 6, if you would follow me, John uh, verses 22 through 27. It said, the next day the crowd had stayed on the other side of the sea, saw there had been only one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, 
They got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. So we see here kind of what's happening here, the scene. Jesus had just got through feeding the 5,000 with a couple of fish and five loaves of bread. And they ate and they were filled. And then we see that he, this is the time where he sent his disciples off and he walked on water to them. And the people began to follow him the next morning. They looked for him. They wanted to know where he was at. Like, where is this Jesus? We must find him. And so they got in the boats and they went off to Capernaum across the sea to look for him. And we see that they're looking for him because they wanted, to, they wanted more food, the temporary food. And Jesus is reminding them and telling them, no, 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 you're seeking this temporary food, but you need to be seeking eternal food. You need to be seeking me. And so that kind of puts up this next kind of section here. So we see he sets the scene. They just experienced the feeding of the 5,000. They've eaten and they were full, and they wanted more. And so they've chased Jesus down. And Jesus, I'm like, no, no, you need to be seeking eternal food, not just temporary food. So it leads them to ask some questions. Verse 28 through 33. What can we do, what can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do we may see and believe you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So again, they've, they've, eat, they've seen the, the feeding of the 5,000, this, this miracle, with a couple of fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus gets to the other side. They chase him down. They want these things. He said, hey, you need to seek the eternal bread. And what's their first response? Hey, what can we do? What can we do? See, there is a mentality that we naturally have that is works-based. We want to earn something. We want to do something. And Jesus is telling, it's kind of contrasting him, like, no, 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 believe. It's, this is that contrast of works-based salvation versus grace-based salvation. It says, Jesus is telling him, no, 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 you don't work for this. You don't earn this. You believe in the one who's been sent. You believe in me. That's where we get verses like Ephesians 4, 2, 8, and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. This is the same issue that we see with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, where he comes up to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Constantly, we want control. Constantly, we want terms, and we want to kind of set the terms when it comes to God. But that's not how we come to God. We come to God by faith and we say, you, I surrender my life to you, I believe in you, I give you my life. You see constantly people like, no, 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 what must I do? I want a list, give me a list, give me things to do because we want control in a sense because we kind of want to determine what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do. We almost treat coming to God as a negotiation. I mean, how many of y'all were in school at one point in your lives? Hopefully this wasn't just me. Lord, if you just let me pass this test, I promise I will study for the next one. It doesn't work, Daniel. Don't go off to college and think that you can, that I've been there, done that, it doesn't work, right? Anybody else ever do that? You have those moments where you negotiate with God. God, hey, if you just let me get through this, I promise I'll prepare myself better for the next time. 
And then you get to that next test and you're like, Lord, I am for real this time. For real, for real, for real. If you just let me pass this test, I'll study for the next one. Just like for real this time. For whatever reason, we want to come to God on our own terms, in our own ways. Jesus just, just told them, don't do the temporary. But you need to focus on the eternal. You need to come after me. And they're like, okay, but what do I got to do to earn this and to get this? And then they're like, he's like, just believe. And they're like, well, give us a sign. The Jews constantly wanted a sign. They constantly wanted Jesus to constantly kind of prove himself. Now, again, they just experienced him feeding the 5,000 with a couple fish and five loaves of bread, and that wasn't enough. The thing about coming and asking for signs and asking for God to show you something is that you will never be satisfied with any of that because you'll always want another and another and another. So I remember this time I was, uh, I worked at this golf course and got to talk to some guys one night about the gospel and about God and all these things. And one of the, one of the guys working there was like, you know what, I, I just need God to give me like a sign. If he would just give me a clear sign, then, then maybe I'll follow. Well, a couple weeks later, working with the same two guys, one of them Taps the other, the guy that wanted the sign said, hey, tell Jason what happened. I was like, what happened? He's like, well, I went to go get some of the carts because no one had been around. I was cleaning up for the night and there was no one around. I hadn't seen anybody, nothing. And I went and got this cart that was sitting off by itself. And when I sat down on the cart, there was a track sitting right there. And I was like, well... There's your sign. He's like, well, no, I wasn't talking about like that kind of sign. I needed a different one. See, the thing is about always asking God to prove himself to you, it will never be enough because you're coming with the wrong intentions to begin with. Jesus even said in Matthew 16, 4, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. And he even told the Jews, I'm not going to give you a sign except the sign of Jonah. Well, the sign of Jonah is Jonah was swallowed and he was dead three days, three nights, and then he was spit up on dry ground afterwards and then came into Nineveh. And Jesus would die on the cross, be buried three days, and then rose from the dead. Don't get trapped in this vicious cycle of demanding from God all the time. Because I'm telling you now, you're coming with the wrong heart and you'll never be satisfied. They'll never be, in the, be able to do enough for you. There won't be enough signs. If you go and read Romans 1, God's like, look at all of creation. Obviously there's a God. But that wasn't enough, so we have to, well, no, it couldn't be that. It's got to be something else. There will always be an excuse. Because it goes back to that idea of like, we want to control God. We want to earn. We want to, we want to have a certain satisfaction. We want, we want to be a part. We want to have a say-so. Man, we want control so bad. We want things done on our terms and in our ways. We always want more. At this point in here, it wasn't simply that God was just enough. They weren't satisfied with that. In one of the commentaries, uh, Leon Morris, he wrote that the people were more concerned about their full bellies than they were their full hearts. Meaning they were more concerned with the temporary things of this world than they were the eternal. And when you're concerned with the temporary things of this world, you will never be satisfied. Ever. I want you to think for just a moment. Everyone in here this morning, because you're in here, and you're clothed, and you're sitting in air conditioning, an air-conditioned building, 
you're a part of the top 1% richest people in the world. Top 1% richest people in the world. Is that enough? You don't need to get anything else for the rest of your life. No new clothes, no new phone, no new TV, no new car, nothing. And you will stay as the top 1% richest people in the world. And is that enough? There's always something else to have in there. There's always something else you want. There's always something else you think you need. Because the temporary things of this world will never, ever satisfy. And that's what Jesus is trying to help them to see. He was like the manna from heaven, heaven, the feeding of the 5,000, all this stuff, it wasn't enough. And Jesus' understanding, based on their questions and their actions, that, okay, nothing's ever going to be, nothing's ever going to satisfy, nothing, nothing is going to, they're not getting the point. He then responds to them, picking up in verse 34 of John 6. They said, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus responded, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I have told you, you've seen in me, yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but I should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What does this mean? Jesus fully satisfies our spirit and our soul. Never to hunger or thirst again spiritually. Could you imagine? I mean, have you ever been hungry and you're kind of like, ooh, something sounds really good and you eat it and it just hits the spot? You ever, anybody else ever had that? You just, you eat that and you're like, oh. You eat it and you're like, oh, that just hit the spot. Did you get hungry again? So it didn't really hit the spot in the sense that it was just a temporary thing that kind of came along and it, come, it came and went. You ever love a food once at some point and then later on you're kind of like, eh, that didn't sound good? You ever have that? Well, Jesus is different when it comes spiritually. See, Jesus is the only one that can ever satisfy us spiritually. Only one. And he satisfies so much so that we'll never thirst, never hunger ever again because he completely satisfies. Jesus even goes on to explain it kind of pushes it even further. The Father will give me all who will believe, and I will keep them, I'll accept them. He even explains that God has a very specific, clear will for those who believe. All those who believe in Jesus will have eternal life and be raised up at the last day. See, God's will is to fully satisfy us spiritually in Jesus, but only in Jesus. Jesus is also explaining here that God's greatest concern for you is not your physical and, and material well-being, but his primary concern for his people is their spiritual well-being. Because see, one day we're all going to stand before the throne. One day we're all going to stand before God himself. And it's not going to matter what we had materially or what we ate physically. None of that stuff's going to matter in that moment. What's going to matter is how we responded to Jesus. And see, that is God's great concern for us, is our spiritual well-being. 
That's why Jesus comes along and says, I am the bread of life. I am giving myself so that you may be satisfied, that you may be filled spiritually. Time and time again, we kind of see throughout the Gospels, Jesus come along. And he goes to this place and begins to heal people and provide for the people. And they take. And then he's like, okay, I'm moving on. And they're like, yeah, but we brought all these other people up here to be healed. All these other people have needs. He's like, I didn't come for that. I came to preach the gospel. And therefore, I am going to the next town to preach it. There was many times that Jesus left people in physical need because the primary purpose was the spiritual needs of the people. That's what God is most concerned about is where you are at spiritually. See, in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. It's all about Jesus. See, the people at this time were making it all about the food in the moment. Hey, that food was good. It tasted good. It filled my belly. I want that. And Jesus is like, no, stop chasing those things and start chasing me. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one that comes and provides and satisfies you. To push that even further, to help the people to see that even more, we pick up in verse 41, chapter 6 of John. He says this, he tells them, it's all about me, and you need to follow after me. And it says in verse 4, Therefore the Jews started complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and i will raise him up on the last day it is written in the prophets as they will be all be taught by god everyone who has listened and learned from the father comes to me not that anyone has seen the father except the one who is from god he has seen the father truly i tell you anyone believes has eternal life i am the bread of life Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day, because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Jesus has to get pretty pointed with the people. Because they're just not getting it. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him, in verse 44. Only those who have listened and learned from the Father are believers, verse 45 and 46. Believers have eternal life, verse 47. Doesn't matter the bread you eat, you're going to die, verse 49. I am the eternal bread, verse 50 through 51. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life, verse 53 through 56. Only hope to live is in Jesus, verse 57. And manna and Jesus aren't the same. He's saying basically... Your ways are temporary, my ways are eternal, in verse 58. Jesus lays it out. It's me or death. There is no other way. There is no other possibility. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can earn. There's there's no signs I can give you. Guys, it's me or death, point blank. I'm the bread of life. You either come to me or you die.
what you're missing in your life is Jesus. Those moments where you feel alone, you feel isolated, you feel, you feel far off, you feel distant, you feel unsatisfied, it's Jesus. Jesus is enough. And for us as believers, when we think about Jesus being the bread of life, we need to reflect for just a moment. See, we know what it takes to physically nourish our bodies, don't we? Healthy food, water, exercise. But often we find ourselves, right, trying to meet our physical needs with anything other than that. Right? I mean, I'm, I do that all the time, right? I'm really thirsty. Mmm, that Dr. Pepper looks good. I know my body needs water. <laughs> but I think this time that Dr. Pepper's going to hit the spot. You know, I know what my body, I know I need to eat vegetables and probably grilled chicken and stuff like that. But you know, that Burger King, I have to drive past it like four times a day. It smells really good. And I'm hungry, and that's going to, that, that, it'll be fine. It'll, it's going to satisfy me, right? It's going to fill my needs. I know what my body needs physically to be nourished. Healthy food, water, exercise. But all the time I convince myself these other things will be good enough. What's well, the same, same thing we do spiritually far too often. We know what we need spiritually. We need Jesus. We need the word of God. We need prayer. We need the church. But oftentimes we convince ourselves we need these other things that are out there will do the job. If I just have a better, if we just have more dynamic music, that's going to fill my soul. Or if we have a more dynamic pastor, that's going to that's meet these needs somewhere. Oh, well, if we just have more events, or if we do more here, or if I get a new church, or if I get new people, or I get a new friends, or maybe if I start a new ministry, or maybe if I get a new devotional, we all the time, we know what we need. God's Word, prayer, Jesus. But we tend, we convince ourselves that these other things will fill that need somewhere else. The reason that biblical illiteracy is so high amongst Christians is because we run to devotional books rather than to the Word of God. Now, devotional books have their place, but they can never substitute you just opening God's Word and reading and meditating and memorizing. There is no substitute for that. But what do we do? That's a lot of work. So I'm going to go read this devotional. It has one little verse. I don't know the context of that verse, but I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to read what this guy says about it, and I'm going to move on. And I, Hey, and then those people are the ones that come to pastors and say, I just feel, I just feel like I don't know God, and there's a distance there. And they, Well, what do you do? Oh, I just read a devotional book over there. Like, so you don't spend time meditating on the Word of God. You don't spend time memorizing. You don't spend time just reading God and letting the Spirit talk. Well, no. I'm like, well, no wonder. You have people that are just, begin, they walk away from the church. You know the vast majority of the people that walk away from the church were never engaged in the life of the church to begin with? And they're like, the church failed me. I'm like, you weren't here. Showing up for an hour or two hours on Sunday mornings doesn't cut it. But see what we do. We know what we need. We know we need the Word of God. We know we need prayer. We know we need the church, and we know we need to be doing those things, and we need, need to look at Jesus. I'm going to look everywhere else. We substitute over and over and over again. Jesus came like, guys, I'm the bread of life. It's me. You need me. You don't need all this other stuff. You don't need all these other things. You need me. If all I did was get up here on Sunday mornings, our entire service, all we did one day was just pray and then just read Scripture. Is that enough? Should be. We've convinced ourselves, though, we need those other things. 
I need to be stirred. I need to be moved. I need to be, uh, we need different lighting. We need, we need Jesus. He's the only one that's going to satisfy. Now, some of those other things that we go to, conferences and all at camps, and all, those things can be good and they, they're wonderful. They can be encouraging, but they can never substitute you just sitting down, opening the Word of God and reading because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Your faith is never going to move without the Word of God. And you go back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. You need to be consuming the Word of God because it's the words of Jesus. You need to be praying. Praying through Jesus. So we really, when we think about him being the bread of life, what does that mean? That means that we're convinced that he alone satisfies. I don't need the things of the world. I don't need uh, a certain status at my job. I don't need a certain family. I don't need certain friends. Jesus is enough to satisfy me. So you've got to ask yourself today, is Jesus enough? Are you convinced in your heart that he is enough? Or are you like these people coming like, no, Jesus, you're great and all, but I need more. I need a good life. I need health. I need wealth. I need a, a, a more dynamic music ministry. I need a more dynamic children's ministry. I need a more dynamic this. I need this. I need that. I need, we need chocolate donuts rather than glazed donuts. I need all these things. What have you convinced yourself that you need to be satisfied in this life? If the answer is anything other than Jesus, you missed the point. He's the bread of life. And all who believe in him will never thirst and never hunger again. And he will raise us up on the last day. See, Jesus so much so is the bread of life when he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What he was saying there is he was pushing them towards the gospel. Because what Jesus was going to do just... Not too long after this, he was going to go to the cross and he was going to die on the cross for our sins. And he was going to be buried and on the third day he was going to raise again from the dead. So we may have life. And see, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because he is the bread of life. All who come to him will be satisfied. If you come to him, Confessing that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you will be saved. But see that confessing that Jesus is Lord, that Lord means master, owner, ruler. That's why Jesus over and over again said, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow me. You've got to be willing to lose your life to save your life. We don't act like the Jews at this moment who come to Jesus and be like, all right, what you got for me? We come to Jesus and we kneel before him and we give him everything. We give him our whole life. That's what it means to confess Jesus is Lord. Lord, you're saying Jesus Everything is yours. For from him and through him and to him are all things, including me. Everything that I am is for you, Lord. And by believing in the gospel, we have eternal life. But it's only through Jesus. He is the only one that is going to satisfy I love my wife. I think she's the best wife to ever wife. If I expect her to satisfy my needs, I have set her up for failure. 
doesn't matter how good she is. She cannot substitute Christ in my life. Jesus has to be enough. And he is. Jesus is more than enough. That's why you have disciple after disciple. Walk before crowds. Walk before people. And give their lives. Because Jesus is enough. That's why we have brothers and sisters in Christ in North Korea in hiding and being beheaded and being tortured and being imprisoned because they have determined Jesus is enough. I don't need the things of this world. And that's why Paul was able to say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain because Jesus is enough. We want to see revival in our church and in our community It's going to come through a people who have determined Jesus is enough. He is the bread of life. He will satisfy. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never followed after him, if you're one of those, you're kind of like, you know what? I am missing something in my life. Today can be the day of for you. And believers, if you're here today and you know what? I haven't been living as if Jesus is enough. I've been substituting Jesus for other things and trying to be satisfied by the things of this world that are temporary. Guess what? His mercies and his grace is new and fresh every day. You can start fresh at this moment. Saying from this moment forward, no matter what I've done, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Start this moment. I am going to live as if Jesus is enough. I am going to read his word. I am going to meditate. I'm going to memorize it. I am going to pray. I am going to gather with the church. I'm going to be a part of the life of the church. I'm going to go after Jesus because he is enough. And I know what my soul and my spirit needs. They need him. So that's what we're going to do. At this moment, we're going to go to time of prayer. And we're going to pray. And I encourage you. Don't leave this place today. Don't get up. Don't move until you're willing to say, Jesus is enough for me. Let us pray. Praise you and thank you for your grace and your love. That while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we may become the righteousness of God. Jesus, you truly are the bread of life. You are more than enough. You fully satisfy. And when we come to you, we will never hunger or thirst again. Father, help us just to be faithful. to lay aside every sin that so easily ensnares us and run the race that you've set before us, fixing our eyes upon you, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us not to be a people that gets caught up in this world being convinced that we need one more thing, one more thing, one more thing in order to be satisfied. Help us always to look to you knowing that you truly are the bread of life. And Father, if there's anyone here today who's never given their life to you, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Spirit, we ask that you bring conviction upon them that they can do nothing else but to cry out, Jesus is Lord. And Father, help us to start fresh today. To be the light and the salt you've called us to be. Be able to say with boldness, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.